talking about for the last several weeks, beginning on May the, uh, April the 23rd, and then April the 30th, of course, May the 7th, and today. So today's our fourth Sunday, and we're talking about the if of sin, the if of sin. And let's read our text this morning, 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 5. We'll put it on the screen there. This then is the message which we have heard of him. And declare unto you that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. Let's count them, All right. So verse number 6. If, that's the first if, we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and we do not the truth. Verse 7. But if, that's the second one, we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Verse 8. If we say, that's the third one, third if, we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, that's the fourth one, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse 10, if, that's the fifth one, we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And how many knows God is not a liar? He's never lied. He's not going to lie. He's not going to start lying tomorrow. He's not a liar. All right, so that's five ifs. Verse number one of chapter two. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, that's the sixth one, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep His commandments. And that's the seventh if, if we keep His commandments. You say, well, I know the Lord, just look at my church attendance. Do you keep His commandments? Well, I know the Lord, look at my hair. Do you keep His other commandments? Well, I know the Lord, look at my lack of makeup or my lack of jewelry or the the way that I dress, but do you keep His other commandments? How about the ones that talk about loving people? You got the standards down, but how about the one that talks about prayer? You got the standards down, but how about a kind spirit, gentleness, meekness, faith, temperance? So we have to, and I'm not, this is not aimed at anybody in particular. I'm just saying we have to make sure, verse number three, that when we say we know him, that we really are trying to keep his commandments. And it's a daily, it's a daily journey, isn't it, folks? Amen. And every day we get out of bed, we need to say, you know what? Today I'm going to try to do better. I'm going to try to do better and be more like Jesus. So we uh, begin by dis- describing sin. We define sin. We then talked about uh, sins being a principle or sin being an act. And within the sin being an act uh, uh, grouping, there are sins of omission, sins of commission. We went over several facts of sin. Some of you were taking notes and you've got all this in your notes. If you need a review, you can always go back to the church website and listen to the uh, audio or you can go to YouTube and listen and watch the video and you can fast forward and rewind and listen to it over and over again. There are two divisions of sin. There are sins without the body and sins against the our own body. The only sin that is against our own body is any immoral act, any sin of fornication or adultery because it involves emotions, the spirit, and the physical body. And Jesus wanted us to know that that category of sin is special in his eyes. It's a heightened level of sin because not only do you sin against him and ostensibly there's a victim that is also offended, but you sin against your own self. Then we talked about classifications of sin. There are sins of the flesh and there are sins of the spirit. Amen. But last week I reminded you that anytime God gives a warning, He also gives a promise. So just about the time it looks like something is very negative, God is really down on something, He always ends by saying, but here's a way out. Here's a way of escape. Here's a blessing associated with that. All right. So last week we talked about how we have a remedy against sin. Thank God that we don't just have a commandment that says, don't sin. But we have a way not to sin. Thank God the Lord's just not standing there in heaven saying, I don't want to see any sin. But he's also saying, but if you'll allow me, I'll fill you with my spirit so you can walk in victory. And you don't have to sin. Now, the six ifs of sin. Last week we started 
with the first if, and that is the if of fellowship with God. Fellowship, which is communion, partnership with God, is predicated, predicated upon our walking with God. Let's go to 1 John 1, 6. We have it on the screen there. If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and we do not the truth. Now, there are six principles that John establishes relative to Christian brotherhood. Let's go to 1 John chapter 2, verse number 9, and we're going to read down through verse number 11. The first principle is... Walking in darkness, according to Scripture, is hating our brother. That's the first principle. And so let's look in 1 John chapter 2, verse number 9. He that saith he is in light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. Now what is John talking about here? Is he talking about just your birth brother? Just your biological brother? No. Boy, my brother and I had some spats growing up. Man, we would beat each other's brains out. But you let somebody else try to touch my brother. Right? I would come to his defense. That's what brothers do. John's not talking about biological brothers here. He's not talking about stepbrothers. He's talking about brothers in Christ. You cannot... Hate your brother or sister in Christ and say, oh, but I love Jesus. I love Jesus. I just hate sister so-and-so. You can't do that. John said, how can you hate your brother whom you have seen and love God whom you have not seen? Somebody say amen. amen. We can't hate our brother or our sister in Christ and then say that we love Jesus. Now, as my wife's bishop used to say, you might, love, you might have to love someone just enough to get to heaven, but you do have to love them. doesn't mean you have to meet them at Starbucks and pretend that you enjoy being around them, but you do have to love them. You might have to love them from afar, but you have to love them. Amen. What is love? It's the absence of hate. Amen? So if you're grappling with strong feelings toward a fellow Christian... And maybe they've offended you. Maybe that situation has not been rectified according to the scripture. And you've not made it right. You really need to put that at the foot of the cross and say, Lord, help me with this. Because I don't want to live a victorious life and go all the way through the end time and be victorious in every area of my life. But harbor resentment or hate towards somebody. Amen. And be lost. And go to the same hell that the drug dealer is going to. And the same hell that the pimp is going to. And the same hell that the gangster is going to. I don't want to be lost because I had hate in my heart toward a person. Somebody say amen. amen. 1 John 3.15. I'm going to ratchet it up a notch because the scripture is very clear on this. The second principle establishing a Christian brotherhood is this. If you hate your brother, then that makes us a murderer. Now, the Bible says that. Don't take my word for it. 1 John 3, 15. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. I don't know how much more plain you can get with that. Okay? Let's keep reading. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. So look, folks. If you hate your brother or sister, John said you're a murderer. And not only is a murderer not going to heaven... But our murderer doesn't have the Holy Ghost living in them. This is very clear. This is very, very clear. Amen. I think we have to make sure that we're putting these principles into practice. The third principle with regard to Christian brother, brotherhood, and John deals with this a lot in his uh, 1 John chapters 1 through 4. We're going to stay, uh, matter of fact, we're going to stay in that book as we're dealing with this. 1 John chapter 4, verse number 20. 1 John 4, 20. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? So if we hate our brother or our sister, that is a strong indicator that we do not love God. 1 John chapter 3, verse 10, the fourth principle involving Christian brotherhood. We're talking about the if of fellowship, that we're dealing with the six ifs. This is the first if. All right, and we're on point number four under the first if. First John chapter 3, verse 10. Let's read it. In this the children of God are manifest, the children of the devil, 
Whosoever doth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. So the fourth principle is this. We are not of God if we do not love our brother. Listen, listen folks. The world sits around and bashes each other. The world sits around and gossips about one another. How many of you know I'm telling you the truth? You can be at the office, you can be at the break room, you can be in the coffee area there at the office, and, and, and people are so free to make snide, cutting, hurtful, hateful comments about other people. Yep. Maybe they don't look like them, maybe they're not the same uh, political persuasion, maybe they're not liberal or conservative enough, maybe they're a different color than they are, and they just say hateful things about people. Our world is filled with hate. I mean, when strangers walk up to strangers and just break their eye socket and beat them in the head for no reason other than the fact that you look like an innocent, you look like somebody I could just take advantage of. You're vulnerable. That's hate. Amen. Matter of fact, our law classifies those as hate crimes. Hate doesn't belong in the, in the people of God. Hate doesn't belong in the body of Christ. Amen. If you sit around with a group of people and you're constantly going back to the same person and talking about the same person and bashing the same person and gossiping the same person, you need to read 1 John 3.10. You need to understand that if you don't love your brother or sister, say, well, I do love them. They just aggravate me. Well, stop talking about them. Amen. Stop talking about them. Stop running your mouth about them and get your spirit right. And you'll find out that, you know what? Life is a whole lot bigger and better than just that one isolated incident that you are fixated upon. That's right. Come on, folks. That's Say, Pastor, who are you talking to? I don't know who I'm talking to. I don't have anybody I'm singling out today. I'm just telling you, this is important. It's so important that John, in the six ifs that he deals with, this is the first one. And he says, if you don't get this down, Pat, if you don't learn how to love your brother, you're not going to get the rest of the other five ifs. you got to get this down. Down. This is kindergarten. You can't go to first, second, third grade till you get through kindergarten. Somebody say amen. amen. Been in church a long time, and I've seen apostolic people who really just need to pray through. They just have a bad spirit towards certain people. And they got it in their gut that it's okay to feel that way. Where do you think you get authority to feel that way? I'm reading to you where Jesus said, Stop it. Amen. Stop hating people. Love people. Amen. 1 John 3, 14. Let's go to the fifth principle here under the if of fellowship. 1 John 3, 14. We know that we have passed from life or death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. So we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. That's the fifth principle. 1 John 2, 9, the sixth principle of the first if of fellowship. 1 John 2, 9, he that hateth his brother is in darkness. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. So the bottom line of these six verses that I've read to you all in 1 John in the first four chapters is loving our brother is an essential prerequisite to having fellowship with God. And I'll just say it again just in case you misunderstood me. You will not go in the rapture if you have hate in your heart. That's right. Period. You say, well, I don't hate a brother or sister. I hate a sinner. I don't think you're going to be saved if, if you have hate in your heart at all. Amen. But you certainly aren't going to graduate in your walk with God with hate toward a brother or a sister. Folks, nobody's worth going to hell over. Amen. You say, well, they just, I can't believe. If you lose your soul over what they did to you, listen to me closely. They win. Yeah. You, hear, you hear what I said? The best thing you can do is move on with your life, keep your spirit right, and let the result speak for itself. Let God bless you and favor you, and that person look at you and say, man, my spirit must be bad because look at them. Look how God is just, they're so happy. You know why we're happy? Because I quit worrying about you. Amen. I quit stressing about you. I quit waking up fixated on you every day. I'm moving on. And there's some benefit to that. Let's go to the second if that we talked about in 1 John. It's called the if of walking in the light. Let's go to 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. This is the second if that we've been repeating for the last four weeks. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Ah, look at the word fellowship there. You think fellowship's important? Yes. 
Paul, uh, John, two times now is tying fellowship to love to your spiritual, your spiritual health. He's saying we've got to have good fellowship. Verse 7, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. So, God is light, and His Word is a light. The Bible says, it's a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. His people are a light when we walk in the light. Now, what does walking in the light mean? It means a habitual lifestyle, outward and inward, in your daily life. Living for God. That's your walk with God. We, you hear people say, I want my walk with God to do well. What is your walk with God? It's your daily lifestyle. It's your daily disciplines of prayer and devotion and fasting and spending time in the presence of God. Church attendance and being involved. And when you're walking in the light as He is in the light, the Bible says, then we have fellowship one with another. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 14. And then we'll come back to um, 1 John here for a moment. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse number 14. That thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right? So how long are we to keep this commandment? Until Jesus comes. Has he come yet? Well, hopefully not because we're all still here, right? And I want to be saved. So we keep it until the rapture, verse 15, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who, hath, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach, unto whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. So if you look, of course, in these verses, he is the light. Verse 16, we are to dwell in the light. So when you're walking with God, you're dwelling in the light. Amen. What's the opposite of that? Dwelling in the darkness. Yes. And some of you remember when you came to know the Lord, you were in the darkness. You were living in darkness. Your life was dim and gloomy and dark. And when you come to God, it's almost like the sun comes out and the birds are chirping and the flowers are blooming and, and, and there's, there's hope, there's peace. Amen. I want you to consider the two powerful events that occur when we walk in the light. Let's go back to 1 John 1.7. 1 John 1.7, the second if we're talking about. When we walk in the light, two powerful things happen. Number one, we have fellowship one with another. And look at this next one. This is awesome. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. So our walk, here's the takeaway, our walk... Our fellowship, our cleansing are all interwoven factors. Our walk, our fellowship, our cleansing are all interwoven factors. Now, I've read to you before when I've been teaching on marriage in the home that Paul says to a husband, if you are treating your wife poorly, God's not going to answer your prayer. That's right. This same principle applies in 1 John 1, 7. Look at it again. If we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship. And that's where we stop a lot of times. We say, oh, well, I want to have good fellowship. But Jesus goes on to say, through John, as the Spirit is moving on Him, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Do you know that when you're treating your brother or your sister poorly, it stops your prayers of repentance, and God says, I'm not going to forgive your sin. In other words, don't ask me to treat you right until you treat them right. Don't ask me to forgive you until you forgive them. Is that not the very teaching of Jesus in the book of Matthew when he said, when you come to the altar and you're asking for repentance and you remember your brother has ought against you, leave your sacrifice at the altar and go to your brother and make that right, then come back and pray. Is that not the same concept? Boy, I would hate to go to hell because I had unrepented sins even though I had tried to ask God to forgive me. But God wouldn't because I had something against my brother and my sister. How do you make sure you keep the line of forgiveness open toward heaven? You keep the line of forgiveness open toward your brother or sister. Somebody say amen. Let's go to the third if. The third if is found in 1 John chapter 1 verse number 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. This is what I call the if of admission. 
Now at birth, each of us became subjected to the body of sin or the principle of sin, the law of sin. That's why Paul said in Romans chapter 8, chapter 7, verse, uh, uh, chapter 7 and 8, when I would do good, evil is present with me. I, oh, wretched man that I am, Romans 7, 24. I, I want to do good, but I can't. Why? Because when you're born as a human, you're born into the principle of sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In times of weakness or temptation, we all have omitted or committed things that are contrary to God's will. And if we deny this, it creates two problems. What is John saying here? If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Now, you might say this morning, I've been raised in church all my life. I've never tasted alcohol. That's great. But maybe you've had the sin of envy in your heart. Or you could say, well, I've been in the world, and man, I know what it's like to taste whiskey, but I've never had hate. Well, but you've still had sin. So we have to be careful not to say anything about our pedigree. I've been in church all my life. My mom was baptized when she was nine months pregnant with me. I just turned 51, so I've been in this all my life. But I didn't get the Holy Ghost until I was 14. Right? And I was a hellion. I was a hooligan. I was that kid in the church that nobody wanted coming to their house. I was rebellious. But when God filled me with the Holy Ghost, he changed my life. Amen. Amen. And, and called me into the ministry, and, and the rest is history. And I thank God for that. So I can't stay, say, stand here this morning and say, I have no sin. I've been raised in the UPC. No, I have sin. I had sin prior to the Holy Ghost. And let's all be honest, we've all sinned after the Holy Ghost. Amen. We need daily forgiveness. We need daily cleansing, right? The goal is not to see how perfect you and I can be and compare ourselves. If we compare ourselves among ourselves, we're unwise. The goal is to get up every day and say, God, I love you so much. I don't want to sin today. But if I commit a sin, I want to hurry up and get it right. And I don't want to do it anymore. And I want to say, that was a mistake and I'm not going to do that. I don't want it to become a habit. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. So if we deny the if of admission, 1 John 1, 8. It creates two problems. Number one, self-deception. We only deceive ourselves while perceiving ourselves as righteous by denying the problem of sin. Number two, the truth is not in us. We categorically deny what the scripture teaches by failing to admit to the sin problem. I don't think anybody here today has this problem, but if you have this problem ever saying, God, I'm sorry, you need to fix that real quick and be quick to say, God, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Don't wait two or three or four days to repent. You sin, find a place to pray and and repent immediately. You think something you shouldn't think, stop right there and say, Oh God, please touch my mind, guard my mind. Lord, baptize my mind right now with purity. If you say something you shouldn't say, Oh God, don't let those words come out of my mouth. You deal with the sin problem right away. Right away. And if you will be careful about that, amen, then you will put your body under subjection and your spirit under subjection. The opposite of what I'm describing to you is what happens in 1 John 1, 8. People that say, well, I have no sin. And Jesus says, oh, no, you do. And you're, you're deceived. Let's go to the fourth if of sin, and it's found in 1 John 1, 9. And I'm going to call it the if of confession. The if of confession. If we confess our sins, everybody say confess. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All right, so let me stop here to all the ex-Catholics in the room. Who is it that is faithful and just to forgive us? The pronoun is he. And we know that he is Jesus. It's not a priest. It's not a man sitting in a confession booth beyond the veil, beyond the screen, With his collar turned on backwards, calling you child, and you're calling him father. There's no precedent of that in the scripture. When you sin, you confess your sin to God. Now, there are some things you should confess to others. We know there is biblical precedent for that. But it's not a priest that you go to confess. It's the person you wronged. You go to them. Husbands and wives, if you are in a successful marriage and you've been married for more than just a couple days, you've learned. There are times you've got to go to your spouse and say, I I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. I was wrong. 
And I don't mean in a sarcastic way. I was wrong. Please forgive me. I'm sorry. Because that's not. Your tone right there shows that you're not even apologizing. But sincerely, I shouldn't have said that about you. I shouldn't have said that to you. I was mad. I was angry. I said it in a heated moment. Please forgive me. I'm going to work on that. I don't ever want to hurt you like that again. I'm sorry. See, that's sincere. You're confessing to that person. That's not the same as going into a booth and saying, Father, I have sinned. Oh, my child, tell me what you have done. Blah, 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 blah. The guy in the booth has done the same thing. He's doing the same thing. Right? So there's no precedent for that. It's not in the Bible. Who we confess to is the Lord Jesus Christ and people in our lives that we have wronged. And so let's talk about the if of confession. Confession to the extent of our sins is the appropriate measure to take. Sinning before God, man or the church should elicit a confession of failure and a request for forgiveness from God and or man. Forsaking our sins after we confess them is a Bible requirement. Let's turn to Proverbs 28, 13 and I'm going to give you book, chapter and verse for why we should not do something and think, well, I'll just confess it and ask for forgiveness. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Amen. And all kids have figured this out. Well, I'll break the rule and then, and then just suffer the repercussions. Right? And my mom figured out that I had figured that out real early. Okay? I figured that out early, but my mom figured out that I had figured it out early. Moms are a step ahead of their kids. Yeah. Proverbs 28, 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. So this is a Bible requirement, but what you cannot do is get into this very dangerous area where the devil convinces you, well, you can go ahead and sin and just ask for forgiveness. It's okay. You better watch that. Because what happens with that is it walks you down a primrose path to becoming reprobate. To where you can sin and not feel any remorse for it. Forgiveness is supposed to be sincere. Amen. And so when I sin on purpose and then I ask for forgiveness on purpose, I'm turning this whole concept of trying not to sin on its head. The Bible says, if we sin. Not when you sin. It says if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. The goal is that we should not sin. Matter of fact, John said, my brethren, I write these things unto you that ye sin not. But if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. <laughs> and when I was youth pastor in Durham, uh, I had the unpleasant job one night after church of confronting a young couple in the youth group that was committing fornication. And I knew they had been committing fornication. And so I got them off to the side. Bishop was out of town. And he said, I need you to talk to them and then call me and t let me know. We're going to have to deal with this. And uh, you can't let fornication run rampant in a youth group. It's a spirit to that. It, gets, it just jumps around, kind of like adultery in a church. you got to deal with it because it's a spirit. And so we got that young couple aside, and I said, when was the last time you all committed fornication? He said, oh, well, it's, a, it's been a while. We've asked God to forgive us. And I said, when was the last time? Last night. See, see the games people play? That's the games people play. Right? And if we hadn't confronted that, it probably would have been that night and the next night and the next night. Because they were playing games. These two little kids raised in church had figured out, we can sin and just ask God to forgive us. It's okay. It's okay. Not okay. You're taking advantage of the mercy of God. Forgiveness of our sins from a faithful and a just God is what 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 is talking about. Let's put it back on the screen. And cleansing from all unrighteousness. Everybody say all. all. And this comes only through the blood of Jesus Christ, which is talked about in 1 John chapter 1, verse number 7. Now we go to the fifth if. The fifth if. I'm trying to finish here in today's lesson Get through this rest of this uh, these points so we can move to another lesson. The if of honesty. Let's go to 1 John 1.10. Everybody say honesty. honesty. Look at your neighbor and say, be honest. Be honest. 1 John 1.10. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. 
and his word is not in us. So we're talking about the if of honesty. Denying acts of sin before and after conversion reveals two facts that are defiant of God. Number one, we make him a liar. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And number two, his word is not in us. God's engrafted word saves our soul. Folks, we need the word of God. James chapter 1 verse 21 talks about that, the engrafted word of God. And if the seed of God remains in us, we cannot sin. And last of all, the sixth if of sin, we're going to dismiss a few minutes early today because uh, we have muffins with mom and coffee. And everybody's welcome to that. I think my wife got close to 100 muffins. Please only take one. Don't say, well, I'm going to go get two then. Just take one. Well, I got two hands. That's two muffins. One hand for the muffin, one hand for the coffee. See, two hands. Go back and get a muffin, and you can fellowship. We've got a little area set up here, and I'm under strict instructions from the first lady to stop talking in just a couple minutes. So, Number six, the if of failure. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Everybody look at that verse. If any man sin. This is the if of failure. God's word is an instructor telling us what sin is and that we shouldn't commit sin. However, that's the goal. Sometimes we have trouble reaching the goal. Thank God that if we sin, there's forgiveness available. Amen. We don't have to sin, but if we sin, we have an advocate, an intercessor with the Father. Our advocate is Jesus Christ. The only mediator, Paul said in 1 Timothy 2, 5, between God and man. And here's the good news, folks. Failure doesn't have to be permanent for the saint of God. Restoration of divine favor comes through obedience to the truths presented in what we're talking about today. Confession, which includes repentance, forsaking the sin, walking in the light, loving the brotherhood, being honest, and having his word. And I've just gone all all over these six ifs. I've gone over all of them right now, just a moment. If you have all of these in your heart, then you can live as much as you can free from sin. People do make mistakes. I've seen good young people mess up. I've seen good young people have a child out of wedlock, and they have a decision to make. You can either stay in church and love God and be faithful and raise that child and let time go by and the pain of the past will diminish, or you can let that failure define you. I've seen good saints of God commit sin. We're talking about the if of sin, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. Thank God that if we sin, we have a place we can come for forgiveness. Brethren who have been offended are hard to be regained. Proverbs 18, 19, Solomon wrote there. Nevertheless, we can restore them, we can win them through forbearance and forgiveness. Some of the things that I've noticed that backsliders deal with, if you see backsliders in the community, one of the common refrains that I hear from a backslider is, I just I love the people, I love the church, I love the pastor, but I'm just ashamed of what happened. I'm ashamed of what I did. That's where you as a child of God can step in and say, hey, let me tell you something, friend. God's forgiveness can overcome that. God can forgive you of anything. And that church doesn't, they're not going to hold that against you. We've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. And we're all just a work in progress. But come on back to the cross. Come on back to the fellowship. Amen. That needs to be the message. That needs to be the message that we give to backsliders, not that we're so high and lofty they can never achieve the level that we're at. There needs to be forgiveness and mercy. All right, we've run out of time. We're going to take our break a little early so we can have muffins and coffee and fellowship. Amen. Let's stand together. Praise God. We're looking forward to a great service today, Believe in God for great things. Let's ask the Lord to bless our, our time of fellowship and, and snacks and also bless the service today. Father, thank you for this opportunity to join together and study your word. We're believing you for a great day today, believing you for a good time of fellowship in these next few moments. Let our worship service be powerfully anointed. Thank you for our guest missionary and his wife that are with us. We ask you today as we, uh, as we go into the, the worship service now that needs would be met, that lives would be transformed.